morning, everyone. Today we will discuss the COVID-19 pandemic, the once-in-a-lifetime economic recession that it has caused, and the increasing role of digital currencies. These are issues that everyone has heard about. However, very few people have heard about the Bank for International Settlements, an institution that is tied to all of these challenges, despite the fact that it might even be the most important bank in the world. The Bank for International Settlements, also known as the BIS, is often referred to as a bank for central banks. But what does this mean? And why do we need such an institution? Furthermore, how can the Bank for International Settlements make sure to facilitate these challenges that are posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and by digitalization? This and more is what we will discuss today with our guest, Dr. Claudia Borio, the head of the Economics and Monetary Department of the BIS. Mr. Claudio, we're very honored to be speaking to you today. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me. I, I always find it particularly refreshing and rewarding to, to talk to students. And I do get opportunities to do that, but uh, probably not as many as I would like. When we prepare for our interviews, we usually try to make a personal pro profile of the guests. But we couldn't find a lot of information about you. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Maybe, Maybe give us a little fun fact. So something about me. You see, I'm very secretive. I mean, you cannot find any information. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm Italian, as the name may suggest. But um, I grew up in Argentina. I went there when I was five years old because my family moved there. Um, then when I finished my school there, I... I went to the UK, it was a gap year, uh, because I felt that uh, I was young and I didn't want to start university immediately and I would have been in Italy. I went to the UK, then uh, for a series of fortuitous circumstances, you know, that movie is sliding, sliding doors, I, <laughs> I ended up do, uh, doing university there, although that was not my plan. So I. I went to Oxford, I spent something like, I don't know, roughly nine years. I did a BA, I did a master's, I did a PhD. I taught there for a while. Then I decided that academia was not for me. I, I wanted to be closer to policy. So I moved to the OECD for a couple of years. Um, and then again, for a series of fortuitous circumstances, I, I ended up here at the BIS. And, uh, I've been there ever since, and maybe the funny part of it is that um, when I joined the institution, uh, I was interviewed and they told me, um, okay, we've seen that you've been moving around quite a bit. If you come here, you have to commit to stay here for at least two years. And I really thought very, very hard about it. And I said, well, I mean, two years, I think I can commit to that. But you see, I've been here ever since. So it's been much longer than that. So how, how was it committing to, to Basel? Do you like the city? Um, well, you know, I've lived in very, very big cities like uh, Buenos Aires, London, Paris. Uh, not big by Asian standards, but anyway, but still big enough. Um, Basel is very small, something like 260,000 uh, inhabitants. It's, um, it's closer to Oxford, but obviously much bigger than that. It's like between London and Oxford. Um, it's very nice. It's very nice. It's, uh, it's close to, it's bordering on France, bordering on Germany. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's got lots and lots of green. Um, uh, I had to get used to the Swiss, um, but it didn't take that long. Um, still, my Swiss German is not very good. Actually, it's terrible. Uh, my German is a bit better. Um, but uh, no, it's, 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 it's culturally very, very alive. So it, it's a nice place to be. It's very it's good to raise children, by the way. So if you, any of you has ever thought about moving, I would suggest coming. Having children? <laughs> we'll go there. Okay, so now it's, it's nice to know a little bit more about you, but we also want to know a little bit more about the BIS. BIS. Because hardly anyone exactly knows what it does. So what does the BIS do? 
Well, I mean, it's interesting that uh, hardly anyone knows what it does, uh, but that is not because I know that there is a certain image that the BIS is a quote-unquote secretive institution, but actually you can find out as much as you want simply by going to our website and, <laughs> and so on. Um, so let me say a couple of things. First of all, it is the oldest uh, international financial institution around because it was established in 1930. Now, having said that, uh, I, and you also said this at the beginning, it's typically known as the central bank of central banks, but we're not a central bank. We're, we, are, we are a bank. But so I think it's, we should be better described as uh, the bank of central banks. Um, now, what do we do? Uh, so first of all, we are a bank, so we are providing banking services to, to central banks. After all, they we, uh, they own us and we work for them. So we provide banking services, uh, mainly we invest foreign currency reserves. Um, the balance sheet of the bank is something like more than $400 billion uh, in deposits. Um, then the other part of the institution, which is kind of bicephalous, is the, it's the economic area for which I'm co-responsible. Um, and that is the area that supports central banks in their mission. And I would say largely, I mean, if you look at the, uh, at the, web, uh, the webpage, it will say cooperation in monetary and financial stability, which is uh, very much, I would say, the lodestar for, for central banks. Um, what do we do more exactly? Well, <clears throat> first of all, we support uh, central bank committees and, and meetings. Uh, the governors come here, well, used to come here, now we do it all through, through the web like this. They come uh, here roughly six times a year uh, to have meetings, to discuss what's going on in the world, to exchange views. There are also a number of other meetings of uh, senior uh, central bank uh, members. And we're talking, for example, of people at the at the deputy governor level or executive director level to discuss everything which is of interest to them. Uh, after all, there is only one central bank per country and they don't have many other people to, to, talk, uh, to talk with and to discuss their problems. Another part of that is that there are a number of standing committees. I don't know whether probably you are familiar with a uh, with a Basel committee, which sets uh, standards for the in banking supervision for the world, but that's only one of them. So that's one part. We provide secretariat services for all of that. Then we carry out our independent uh, research and policy analysis, which you can find in our publications, and uh, uh, that is also used as background for the meetings uh, that I was describing before and for the committee work. Uh, we disseminate statistics, we produce and disseminate statistics, mainly in the international banking uh, sphere. And now there is a new kid in the block, if you like, which is related to what you were saying at the beginning. Uh, we are developing a technological arm, uh, which is the so-called innovation hub, which in addition to being a place where central banks can exchange views, as we do for the other committees, what it does in particular is to provide uh, specific technological solutions, prototypes that could be used by the central banking community as a whole uh, in the form of a public good. Um, and that is done in close cooperation, again, with the central banks. Well, thanks for this answer. I think it's very interesting to see also how the BIS has progressed to all of these purposes. Well, it started initially with a very different purpose, right? Yes, uh, well, uh, well it's, uh, the, the, initial, uh, the initial purpose was to um, uh, help with the war reparations of Germany. Uh, but even from the beginning, uh, the institution already started uh, holding meetings of, of central banks. I mean, Mont Montague Norman, who, who was the, at the time the governor of the Bank of England, he had this dream of uh, creating a club for central banks. And effectively, this is what the BIS turned into. Uh, from the beginning, it started producing, uh, acting as a think tank. It was now, of course, you have the WIO from the IMF, uh, the OECD economic outlook and so on. But at the time, the BAS annual, or annual report was the only document that was looking at uh, the global economy. And, what, uh, and that was produced annually uh, since then. 
And it also started producing statistics. Um, then it went into hibernation during the war, uh, and that was a pretty difficult time. But effectively, it kept the lines of communication open, and that's, uh, which was important. And then it flourished after the, after the war. Um, Although it was almost closed, uh, you know, in the, during the at the Bretton Woods uh, um, discussions, and it flourished af after the war, adapting to the changes in the economic uh, and political environment. So, first of all, if you like, the the focus of cooperation was uh, monetary policy, particularly in the international arena. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the growth of the euro markets in the sixties as a result of controls in the US. So you had this big international market in dollars that was growing, and that was very much the attention at the time, but from a monetary policy perspective. Um, then starting in the 70s, when the financial system was uh, liberalized, it moved from monetary policy focus to a financial stability focus, and that is when some of the committees were established. And it also moved from being largely a European institution to a more global institution. So in the, per, in the first, until I would say the early 90s, the focus was very much European, European and the BIS also played a role in the establishment of the ECB. But after that, partly as a result of the establishment of the ECB, it, it uh, adopted a more global perspective. We had new members and so on. Now we have uh, 63 central banks uh, that are members of the BIS and this la uh, the latest round, I think, was last year when three new central banks joined. So, if you like, from monetary to financial stability and from a European institution to a global institution, but not a universal institution in contrast to the IMF or the World Bank. So now that we know more about you and the BIS, we want to talk about what's going on in monetary policy right now. So, well, I thought it's going on in monetary policy right now. So, <laughs> what bits would you time. be interested in, in particular? Well, yeah. Yeah, okay, so. let me just tell you something about COVID, and and, and then if you oh, like. we have a, we have a question for you. Ah, we <laughs> have worry. a question. Okay. Yes. So, before 2020, we lived in a world with interest rates in several countries close to or lower than zero percent. Therefore, there were fears that central banks had exhausted their possibility, their ability to deal with economic recessions, because the way that they normally did this was by cutting short-term interest rates, mm -hmm. which is near impossible when they're already 0% or even negative. That's so right. therefore, how could central banks then, at the start of the corona crisis, start to maintain financial stability? Okay, so I think you should think of uh, two functions of, uh, of central banks. Um, the first one that really goes back to the very origin, which is closer to the origin of central banks, was not to run monetary policy as such or directly. It was mainly to <coughs> act uh, to run payments and to uh, act as a lender of last resort in, in times of trouble. I mean, monetary policy during the gold standard, in particular, was very, very passive. Uh, you roughly held interest rate constants until the the convertibility constraint, which was acting as an anchor for monetary policy and for interest rates, would, would give way. And so, um, because go the, the quantity of gold that you had was limited. Um, so, setting monetary policy, changing interest rates, but in particular under the gold standard, acting as a lender of last resort, which means that when run banks run into trouble, you simply lend more to them. So what happened during the, the COVID crisis uh, was um, that, in particular, the financial system ran into trouble. And central banks uh, acted as, again, as lenders of last resort, except that because uh, now financial markets, the financial system has changed so much, and banks are a smaller part of the whole uh, system. They also acted as, if you like, buyers of last resort or market makers of last resort, buying uh, assets from uh, and preventing prices from falling too much. So you had these two roles. But the other thing to bear in mind is that although until the great financial crisis of 2007 or 9 or 8 and 9, depending which date you take, central banks were um, using monetary, were implementing monetary policy only by changing interest rates. 
partly because they got close to the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound, they also started um, implementing monetary policy through many other means, uh, including buying assets, government sector, large, large quantities of uh, uh, government securities, even private securities, this is and providing. Easing, uh, correct. Sorry. This is quantitative easing. Well, quantitative easing is yeah one way of thinking about it, uh, but it's not the only way. But yes, that's part of it, and they're also providing special land loans to banks at uh, subsidized rates. So if you like, the, the tools, the, the, the very neat distinction that we had until the great financial crisis between monetary policy, standard monetary policy that was moving interest rates, and emergency liquidity support or emergency crisis management, which was largely through emergency liquidity support and so on, became very, 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 very blurred. And a lot of what central banks did after the COVID crisis or in response to the COVID crisis was to use their balance sheet very, very actively and acting as uh, lenders or buyers of last resort. But the problem that you mentioned hasn't gone away. I mean, the, the room for maneuver has narrowed. Obviously, there is not much you can do with interest rates. Also, of course, you can technically buy the whole economy, but uh, there are diminishing returns and problems with that. I mean, it's not a free lunch. And so the economic, and I would also say the political economy uh, limitations of what central banks are doing are, are still very much there. Why, why do you say it's not a free lunch? Well, it's not a free lunch because, uh, well, take it to the extreme, first of all, just to make it very, very simple. I mean, if the central banks ended up buying the whole economy, it wouldn't be a market economy any longer. So you can see what the limit of all this is, and you don't really want to get even close to that. Um, and then uh, many people know that there are, and I'm sure you do, particularly coming from the Netherlands, that there are um, uh, there is collateral damage or their side effects of very low interest rates for very long. They tend to um, in, uh, <coughs> create incentives to take on risk, which over time can generate financial uh, fragilities and financial stability problems. We could go into many of these things if you're interested in. They can also uh, sap the resilience of the uh, financial system, not just of banks, because their interest margins are compressed, but also for insurance companies or pension funds and the like. Um, they also tend to distort the allocation of resources because if everyone can borrow at a zero rate, it's very, very hard to distinguish the companies that are healthy and have good prospects from those that don't. This is the issue of the quote unquote zombie companies. That, yes. uh, and so, and you can see what the problem is. If you, if you keep interest rates low for very long, uh, if you create financial fragilities and then financial fragilities are a source of or can amplify recessions, then you, you continuously, you run uh, out of room for maneuver over successive uh, business and financial cycles, which is one of the reasons why interest rates are as low well as they are now. Do you anticipate that these tools will become standard practice into the future, or is this a one-off? It's interesting. I mean, in principle, you know, emergency measures are uh, for emergency situations. But I think that what has happened is that partly because of the loss of uh, room for maneuver, uh, these tools are likely to stay for, for much longer. In fact, some of the, there is something ironic about the language that we're even using about these tools. I mean, they, they are known as unconventional monetary tools, yeah. but mm -hmm. these unconventional tools are becoming conventional. And it's quite possible that some of the tools that were put in place uh, during the crisis uh, will become standard tools going 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 ahead and but moreover what's happening is is not that uh, the the toolkit itself is becoming more complex uh, more multifaceted uh, for some central banks is that more and more central banks around the world are finding themselves in a similar situation and therefore resorting to these tools i mean emerging market economies this would have been unthinkable before the, the current crisis, and yet they're facing similar issues. But they're even they're more reluctant than their advanced economic counterparts in using these tools because of the 
Uh, Could you give us some examples of that unconventional tool? That were, have been used in yes. emerging market economies or in general? Um, um, in general. In general, okay. Uh, well, you mentioned QE, but basically what, I mean, to put it simply, rather than simply uh, changing interest rates, you buy large quantities of government securities, you buy large quantities of uh, private sector securities, and you, you, you do that sometimes without, but at the same time, increasing the, the amount of deposits that the bank, uh, the central bank has with banks. That's called money, although it's not really money, but that's one way of thinking about it. So you finance the purchases of these assets by issuing money. Uh, that's one way of doing it. The other is, as I mentioned earlier, you are providing banks with very, very cheap funding at below market rates. And that's, uh, that's something that, uh, again, in the past would not have been uh, something that central banks would have done. <laughs> Although some of these quantitative measures that I'm discussing now, they were already there, but uh, they had, uh, particularly after the war and in the early 60s, but then they were abandoned uh, because it, it was felt that they were too intrusive. Um, and so and in the case of emerging market economies, they started mainly by buying uh, government debt. But then, of course, uh, uh, there is the perception that some of that could be, quote unquote, monetary financing. And that could have, uh, and markets are much more jittery about uh, what emerging market economies are doing than what, uh, what advanced economies are doing. So there are tighter limits, constraints to what emerging markets uh, can do compared with what advanced economies have done. Something we were also wondering is will all this monetary policy that we've seen during the COVID-19 crisis also actually translate into the real economy? So more people getting jobs again, supporting small to medium uh, enterprises, or will this only save the financial markets? <laughs> no, it definitely, it definitely has a, a, an impact on the on economic activity. Um, uh, the let's go back to the great financial crisis. Um, it's clear that uh, first of all, without central banks' intervention. The system, uh, the financial system would have collapsed. And we know from history that if the financial system collapses, also the real economy collapses and people lose jobs and, and so on. So that was during the crisis phase. But also during the recovery, the fact that central banks kept monetary policy uh, so easy was a contributing factor to, uh, to the recovery and was instrumental in getting the economies back on track. And the same, I would say, it has been true uh, in this in in the COVID crisis. So, uh, in the first phase, when central banks had to go in more like in lender of last resort mode, that prevented again the financial system from uh, from uh, dragging down the economy. And uh, at the time, I would say that the impact of interest rates was more indirect on spending because if you're at home, I mean you. There is a limited amount of things that you can spend on. But it was important in um, easing uh, the conditions by pushing up financial markets, as, as you were saying, by creating the conditions that were making it easier for companies to borrow and therefore to stay in business. And in fact, they've done a lot of that. Um, but, but again, there are, I mean, the work that uh, is being produced suggests that there are diminishing returns to, to these measures. And this is a big challenge for central banks because uh, how do you how are you going to regain room for maneuver that is to raise interest rates again to reduce the size of the balance sheet to be able to deal with a, a future recession more easily if again if you, even if the economy is doing well if inflation remains very low and below targets. And this has been the biggest challenge that central banks have faced uh, since the great financial crisis. Is now, before the, the crisis, why, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Is this the reason why uh, central banks have been asking for government to do more? Definitely, because I mean, to the extent that they have less room for maneuver, um, they need support from other policies. Plus, the fact that this crisis—they were saying that even before this crisis. 
but this crisis is something which is much better tackled uh, through fiscal policy than it is to, through, through monetary policy. But going back, I mean, the biggest challenge central banks face is the fact that inflation has remained stubbornly low despite everything that they have thrown at it, if you like. And there are some probably more structural reasons why that is the case. And unless so those structural, those stru if, if this is indeed the reason, unless uh, those structural factors disappear, we're likely to live in a world with very low inflation for a very long time. And the, the, the factors that I would focus on, that, that, that we have focused on in the annual economic uh, report and in our publications, have been uh, globalization and uh, technology factors that effectively have uh, reduced the bargaining power of labor, the pricing power of firms, and therefore have made the old, <laughs> remember the wage price spirals? Well, you don't remember because you're too young, but I, I can remember the wage price spirals of the 70s, you know, uh, a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. But this is the biggest challenge. This is really the biggest challenge. It's, it's as if your enemy had disappeared, so you don't, don't exactly know what you can do. Do you see any, any any hope in this situation? Do you think that that central banks will regain tools, or or in the future be able to deal with these kind of recessions, or are you more bleak when looking into the future? Oh, well, when I'm in this uh, in these kind of uh, situations, um, I think I'm always very optimistic. <laughs> Uh, personally, I think that they're really a, a, a difficult challenges and um, part of those challenges are economic, as I said, part of those challenges or issues that need to be addressed are of a more uh, intellectual, uh, intellectual character, have an intellectual character. And <coughs> so, th as I mentioned in, the <coughs> in my presentation at the annual general meeting, Excuse me. By the way, this is not COVID. This is just <laughs> my, my season. And even if it was COVID, you would be safe, uh, you know. <laughs> that side. Yes. So, um, uh, so that was uh, as I had mentioned, as I mentioned in the annual general meeting when we were presenting the annual economic report, rebuilding room for maneuver is going to be the challenge in, in the decades ahead. But this is not just for monetary policy. After the COVID crisis, it's also true for, for fiscal policy. I may be also true for prudential policy because banks are not out of the woods. They have done much better than during, you know, one way of putting it, people say that banks have been part of the solution as opposed to being part of the problem as they had been before the great financial crisis. And that's largely, I would say, as a result of the financial reforms that have been put in place. You, you were mentioning earlier, <coughs> are central banks just saving financial markets and saving the banks. Well, in fact, no. Uh, following the great financial crisis, a lot of efforts were uh, made in the regulatory prudential uh, supervisory sphere to raise the amount of capital that banks had. And, you know, and central banks uh, are supervisors in many, many cases, including in, in, in the Netherlands. So they played a reading, uh, leading role there. Now, because banks were in much better shape before this crisis, they could, the super, supervisors actually leaned on them in order to get them to lend more, to try and protect the economy, and by protecting the economy, also protecting themselves. But of course, there are limits to how much, uh, how, how far one can do that. And given that the situation now is um, proving longer lasting uh, than one had originally anticipated, it is indeed possible that banks will find it harder going forward. So at some point, banks themselves will need to replenish capital. So we need fiscal authorities to consolidate. We need central banks to uh, build more room for maneuver in terms of the size of the balance sheets and interest rates. We will probably need uh, banks to rebuild capital. Now you can see how this is, uh, is going to be quite challenging going forward. So when you say that fiscal authorities have to consolidate, what do you mean by well, fiscal? <coughs> when you said fiscal authorities have yeah. to consolidate, well, you have to you have to make sure that the amount of debt that you have is sustainable, and uh, so that it doesn't create problems either for monetary stability or problems in the market, uh, particularly if you cannot 
if you cannot um, issue your own currency. So the problem, they, the specifics of the problem varies. So if you take emerging market economies or if you take countries in the euro area that cannot issue their own currency, then the problem is that uh, all of a sudden you will see your credit spreads go through the roof and you can have a sovereign crisis. Now, a sovereign crisis is bound also to generate a banking crisis and is bound to generate an economic crisis. So you want to avoid that. And that's the bigger problem for emerging market economies and for some countries in the euro area. For the others that have more room for maneuver, the problems are, if you like, even longer term. And I would say that there, they, uh, assuming that they can remain uh, solvent, the biggest issue is uh, monetary policy, monetary stability. Because imagine, imagine that your debt increases a lot. Um, then I mentioned earlier that central banks will have to regain room for maneuver. But then raising interest rates will mean that the interest payments uh, on the government uh, on the government uh, accounts will will balloon so fiscal deficits will increase further and it would be harder for for the governments also to borrow in the market so we'll put pressure on the central bank to keep interest rates low for longer and then some of the various problems that we mentioned earlier either in the form of monetary stability higher inflation or in the form of financial stability will be there so that's why it's absolutely essential that the fiscal accounts are in good shape. You know, the, the, the public sector, the banks uh, and the rest of the economy rely on uh, uh, fiscal policy to save them if problems uh, arise. You know, as for example, banks need to be recapitalized. The economy needs to be boosted. Um, but who is so the, the government is the backstop to the economy but who is the backstop to the government effectively no one and that's why it's essential that uh, governments keep their finances in order so quite a dilemma we're in okay. because uh, even if we move past the corona crisis we'll still have very long-term long issues to deal with but since, but since the beginning of this crisis many economists have been playing alphabet soup with what the recovery will look like some have called it the V-shape, a W-shape recovery. What do, you what do you think the recovery will look like? <coughs> well, <clears throat> I would say, that's my personal view, if um, um, until we got the second wave uh, of the virus, I thought that the recovery would be like, uh, you know, this, what do you call it, whoosh, swoosh, what is the? Uh, Nike swoosh. Nike, <laughs> Nike thing. So it, uh, it would take uh, some time. The, the way back would be slower than the way down. Okay. Um, and, uh, but now that we have a second wave or a third wave, every time you have a wave, there is going to be a, a dip down. And the more waves you have, the weaker the economy will become and the harder will uh, the road back is, is going to be. Uh, you know, what we have seen so far, and this also speaks to what the role of central banks can be. We talked about the, uh, the crisis, the acute crisis phase, um, which is uh, more in line with the role of central banks as a lender of last resorts. There, what is key is for central banks to lend in one form or other, either by lending or by buying assets and so on. And that's what they can do. But what central banks cannot do is to spend. <coughs> and we are moving from the liquidity phase of the crisis to the solvency phase, where many firms, whether we like it or not, uh, will face serious solvency issues. Some of them are going to go bust. Some of them are going to be liquidated. Some of them will require that debts to be written down. And this is part of the reallocation of resources from those sectors that are likely to do well post-crisis, post-COVID, and those that are likely to do less well. And obviously things like airlines and whatever are not going to be doing as well as they did before, where anything that has to do with technology is probably going to do better. So you need a real transfer of resources. And in order to, to do this, you need uh, the public sector to provide some bridge funding, bridge spending power, and uh, also to use its own balance sheet to, to help the restructuring of the firms. So central banks could do well in the first phase, they can do very little in this second phase, 
And the second phase is essential if you want the economies to recover. So this is going to be a much uh, longer process than we originally expected. Indeed, at the beginning, I, I thought that this was going to be a very quick mm -hmm. shape uh, uh, economy um, because I thought that uh, the uh, pandemic would disappear within a year or so. But obviously, I was, I was badly wrong. Mm -hmm. So let's now turn to another issue that will also, um, according to some, play a very big role in our future, digital currencies. So as we all know, at least in the Netherlands, the use of cash was already very much in decline before the pandemic. But now, curiously enough, the pandemic has accelerated this even more because people don't want to transmit the virus through paper notes. And the BIS actually, alongside many other central banks, recently published a report about a new kind of central bank money, namely central bank digital currencies, also known as CBDCs. Yes. How would you explain what a CBDC is to my grandparents that are also watching this live? To your grandparents. I mean, to your grandparents, uh, <clears throat> or even to you. I mean, uh, the, problem with the, uh, the problem with the CBDC is that there is no agreed lexicon. And, uh, and people use it in, in different ways. What I would say is that, well, there are two types of CBDCs. One, which is not really the focus of this, uh, of this discussion, which is for payments between, uh, between banks or payments between financial institutions and the like. And that has more to do with the efficiency and risk management in um, in payments and settlement systems, in wholesale payments and settlement systems, and in the link between those payments and the transactions that uh, underlie those payments. So, for example, purchases of securities and the like. So that's one one thing. But that's a question of efficiency. I don't think we need to talk about that. No, we can uh, talk about the other one. <laughs> we can talk about the other one. And that's the what one might call retail <coughs> or general purpose CBDC. And that would be the CBDC that all of us uh, would have access to in our daily lives. Um, now, the key purpose, uh, the key purpose of a CBDC would be the fact that, as you said, you may imagine that uh, cash were to disappear, that people didn't want to use cash any longer. There would still be a role for uh, people to have a claim on on the central bank, because that, that's the safest type of claim. And that's basically what cash is. So the question is, how can you ensure in a world in which, for example, you don't have any paper, uh, any cash any longer, or cash plays a very, very limited role, what, uh, how could uh, central banks provide something similar? And that's effectively what CBDC is. It's allowing people like you or me have the possibility of having a claim on the central bank, a claim that I can use in the transactions that I do on an, every day. Now then, th that's, a big, uh, that's a big point, uh, except that rather than being cash, uh, it would be a digital claim. Um, everything else is just complications. Uh, so you see that in principle, it's relatively straightforward. Now, when you go one level deeper, and things start becoming more complicated. So is that claim going to be something very much like cash that I can exchange with you, like an e-wallet or, or, or whatever? Or is it going to be a, a deposit that people will have with the central bank? Now, to, those are two forms of claims. But which of the two uh, should one have? If you want to have something which is closer to cash, it would be more like, more like, quote unquote, an e-wallet. There are a number of possible ways in which you can do it. If you want something more like a bank deposit, then it would be like a deposit with a central bank. So the question is, which way to go? So that's one example. Um, but the, the big economic questions that underline all this have to do with what kind of system you would like to have. And the, the, probably, I don't know, there are many documents that have been produced uh, by the BIS and so on, on on this issue. But in economic terms, um, let me just mention two of the big questions. One has to do with financial stability, going back to financial and monetary stability. So again, one has to do with financial stability. <coughs> one concern 
is, for instance, that uh, once uh, you have a digital claim on, on the central bank, it will be easier for you to transfer money from your deposit account to the account of the central bank during times of stress. And that could therefore facilitate runs on the banks. So that's uh, one concern that central banks have that have to deal with uh, in establishing a uh, central bank uh, a CBDC. Then there are the questions, the possibilities that a CBDC opens, because then a key possibility would be that of charging negative interest rates on, on uh, central bank money. But do you want to do that? I mean, uh, do you think that that's a good idea? Uh, and we were talking about some of the side effects of very low interest rates for long. If they're negative, there are even more side effects. And then I just ask you, I mean, do you think that uh, if you, if people charged, if you were charged a negative interest rate on, uh, on an account, uh, would you spend more or would you spend less? I mean, it's not even, it's not obvious. You, so what about you two? I'm curious. I mean, would you mean then that in my, in my digital wallet, I would, have, I would have my digital currency and, and that, would that would have an interest rate on it as, a, as opposed mean, to what I have now. You can imagine the, if it was a digital wallet, it doesn't need to be a digital wallet. Okay, but let's imagine that it was a digital wallet. So today you would have a hundred in a uh, hundred uh, euros in your digital wallet. Uh, in a year's time, you only have uh, 99 or, or 90 or, or whatever, you know, depending, you could, in principle, you could charge uh, any rate you like. Yeah. So the question is, if you have uh, a negative rate uh, on, your, on your wallet, will you spend more of it? Or would you try to save more uh, because you will need more money to buy things in the future? I might put um, my money somewhere else. Uh, well, where, 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 where would you put it? Where would you put it? Why not, Why not to, in a normal commercial bank? Well, then uh, if, if central banks start charging negative rates on their, on their <coughs> money, it's very likely that uh, banks will also charge negative rates. You know, the reason why banks, some of them already do, by the way, particularly to the large customers. Some already have started doing it uh, with their small, um, smaller customers. The reason why they're not doing it is because they're afraid that uh, people will put money in cash. Mm -hmm. But if, if you put your money in cash, you also get a negative rate. You will also get a negative rate on your deposit account. So that doesn't count. So where else will you put your money? Gold. <laughs> But doesn't it's this... not easy because <laughs> all financial claims will also tend to have negative interest rates and yield a negative sum. So this is one big issue. Would central banks like to do that? Yes or no? I suspect that before cr crossing that bridge, they would think uh, very, very hard. So what the one of the documents that you have seen uh, indicates is that there are some general principles that uh, central banks would like to uh, a CBDC to to uh, to follow to be consistent with. One is that it would not really <coughs> alter too much the nature of the financial system, so that it would be a complement to uh, to a, a bank services as opposed to being a substitute for bank services. So that's an important principle. Another is is that it should not stifle competition, but it should be a catalyst for greater competition within the financial industry. And a third one, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is that it should be fully consistent with monetary and financial stability. So you see there are a number of principles and central banks are thinking very, very hard about this. Um, I was looking at, at a survey just to give you some numbers. And this again, you can find on, on the BIS website. And the, the survey looks at 66 central banks around the world in 2019-19. And <coughs> so uh, something like one third, uh, uh, no, 10% says that they are likely to be uh, introducing a, some form of uh, uh, special uh, of CBDC over the next three years or so. But that's a, a very small number. And that's not even a decision that they might, might be doing that. Uh, but still 60 or over 70% are unlikely to do anything in this sphere. And why do you think that is? Why, why are they so hesitant? As I mentioned to you earlier, um, first of all, because um, 
the uh, there are some very deep issues that need to be addressed. Quite apart from, and I didn't mention cybersecurity. I mean, of course, your cash can be stolen, uh, but uh, CBDCs can also be hacked, and then the potential can be almost infinite. Uh, so you have these uh, cybersecurity issues. You have these economic issues that I mentioned earlier. The idea that you don't want to even to get rid of cash. You want to have people uh, to give people the opportunity to do it. You've got these uh, implications for financial stability, for monetary stability. So that's and quite apart from any technical challenges that are, that arise. So that's why central banks are thinking very very hard. And moreover, for many central banks, there is no no real impetus because uh, yeah, in some countries, like in the Netherlands or in Sweden, in particular, cash is uh, falling out of use. But in many, many others, it, it isn't. And so, and if on the one hand, for example, a CBDC could support financial inclusion, uh, depending on how it is structured and in emerging market economies in particular. On the other hand, it could also increase financial exclusion because uh, you know people that are have a certain age will find it much harder to uh, to use uh, this kind of money than uh, you know cash they're very used to cash that's why <coughs> and let me repeat even in sweden when they're thinking of uh, how of introducing once uh, cbdc's they are trying to make sure that cash will also remain in use so you said that uh, CBDCs could cause exclusion, but how, but how could they also cause inclusion, especially well, in emerging uh, markets? Well, it depends. It depends on how you structure it. If, for example, if everyone has an ID, an, ID, uh, an identification uh, code, then you could easily transfer uh, CBDC to them, uh, even if they don't have a bank account. So that's uh, that's a, that's an example of how it could. So it all depends on how it is structured. Yeah, and I guess we'll see in the future. Um, but the something future. else. We'll see in the future, you're you're probably going to see a lot of it. I guess. <laughs> we'll see it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but despite the fact that you said that a lot of central banks are still hesitant, private companies already seem to be increasingly interested in issuing digital currencies. For example, Facebook famously wants to issue its currency, the Libra. So why yeah. would we also need central bank digital currencies if the private market is already willing to offer them? Well, I mean, the, the key thing is that if you look through history, uh, central banks have always been at the cornerstone of the payment system. And they are at the cornerstone of the payment system because ultimately they have the government which is backing them. Ultimately, they can produce uh, money in a, in a very elastic way. And ultimately, the claims on the central bank and the safest claims around. Uh, now, these private schemes don't have a number of those characteristics that uh, would make them safe and uh, efficient as central bank money is. But having said that, one has to recognize that the, uh, the possibility of these schemes uh, coming into, into operation and being effective has also, I have to say, uh, spurred central banks to get their act together and to improve the, the current payments and settlement systems that they have. Now, that doesn't need to have any CBDC. That doesn't need to have any cryptocurrencies or, or whatever. I mean, it can be done with the, within the current infrastructure if that infrastructure is upgraded. And uh, I guess you're familiar with so-called fast payments, which uh, basically it's almost inter instantaneous payments 24 seven. Uh, now those rely a lot precisely on this central bank infrastructure and on central bank money. And uh, they're becoming quite popular. Now th those can give you very much the same benefits in terms of convenience and the like that other forms of, of, of money could, but they could be much safer. And that I think is, is critical. So, so I don't, th I think that, as I mentioned earlier, in fact, the, the, the initial justification, uh, raison d'etre for the existence of central banks was not monetary policy. Monetary policy as, a, as an art, if one can say that, or as a function in terms of actively trying to stabilize the economy, something that only goes back to the 20s, 30s. It wasn't there before. But payments has always been there. 
So payments is absolutely essential. And for and we had a couple of if if uh, people like you or others are interested, we had a couple of uh, chapters in the annual economic report of the BIS that comes out in June every year, uh, which are also written more for not for specialists. That have one chapter was on cryptocurrencies generally. Another chapter is was on uh, this year on payments in general, retail payments in particular. And if you want to get a slightly more "quote unquote" sophisticated, I also I also have a a working paper or a lecture on on money. We'll link it in the in the events. We'll link, we'll link it in the events, so the watchers can also see it. <laughs> so, which is basically the history of money uh, and how that ties in with all the issues that we're facing today. Yeah, so you discussed how um, private digital currencies don't have the key advantage that central bank currencies have, which is this safety. But these private companies like Facebook, for example, Facebook has 2.7 billion users. Are you afraid that this less safe form of money might outcompete central bank forms of money if the central bank don't act fast enough? I mean, you said that only 70% uh, is, is thinking about digital currencies right now. Yes. But let me let me say two things. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, digital currencies are not a necessary central bank digital currencies CBDCs are not a necessary condition for or indeed a sufficient condition for having effective payments. Ultimately what people want is safety and convenience. And you can produce that safety and convenience without uh, you know, having CBDCs simply by upgrading the current systems. One issue that is still, which is proving a little bit harder to, to deal with, which for example, may be one reason why things like uh, Facebook money and so on are, are successful, is <coughs> cross-border payments, which are still more difficult than one would like and more costly than one would like. And that's why now there is a big, big international effort at the highest level, you know, the G20, there is a huge political commitment to get that done over the next uh, few years and to make it as efficient and as effective, if possible, although that's more like an ideal, as uh, domestic payments are. And if Facebook were to achieve the safety and convenience, is there a real chance that this could have negative consequences for monetary policy if we see users in the economy shifting to Facebook, to this let digital me, dollarization. Let me stick my neck out. I mean, I don't think it's possible to reach the same degree of safety and convenience. That's precisely why central banks exist. That's precisely why they were created. Because in one way or the other, any private form of money, and this is basically also what my, uh, my lecture indicates, is based on some form of uh, government money, um, some central bank money, for it to be successful. It could be successful for some time, but then at some point or other, some of the inherent uh, contradictions that exist uh, will, will emerge. So let's now look into the future. What do you think that children in 20 years' time will remember cash and bank cards, or will they only know digital currencies or other forms of digital payments? <laughs> how fast do you think this uh, future will look like? Or how soon I think will it will depend on your generation. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if, you are, uh, if you don't want to see any, if you don't want any paper money any longer, if you don't want, if you, ultimately this is customer preferences. If, uh, if people don't want to use any paper money any longer, there won't be any paper money any longer. And, but look at look at the history of uh, look at the history of money. First of all, we, you know it was pebbles and so on, and uh, whatever physical pieces of physical commodities. Then the the deposit the deposit that people are so familiar with was uh, did not exist uh, until uh, the late part of the nineteenth century, the first part of the twentieth century. Before that, what banks were doing was issuing notes. Mm -hmm. were not issuing, they were not transferring things on their on their accounts. I mean, if you go further back, there was some of that. But so the technology has changed, and the, the technology and the form of uh, money uh, has uh, reflected uh, 
technological advances, but also the, the preferences of uh, you and me and everyone who's using them. <clears throat> So sadly, right now we're coming to the end of the interview, but we still have one final, uh, mostly right now, hypothetical question about the future. So if the BIS were ever to issue its own digital currency, do you have any idea what it would be called, or what it could be called? We have some suggestions if you don't the have busy. any ideas. What? The BZ. The BZ. <laughs> Yeah, we were thinking of Bitcoin, maybe, for the competition no, with the private. That's uh, also very good. Yeah, you, you are better than I am, but uh, <laughs> busy might be catchy. Busy, busy not with we'll B U S I, but B I Z or B I Z Z Y. Busy. <laughs> because okay, after well, all, German in German B I S is uh, Bits Bank, right? Mm, yes. Yeah. Is that Swiss German or normal? No, German? I mean it. Uh, bank for in my what is it called? Zahlungsausgleich, and that's what the Z stands for. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for this interview. I think I speak for for Luis as well when yes. I say that we we learned a lot and we enjoyed ourselves very much. Now for our audience and maybe also for you if you have time and are interested, uh, we have an interview next week on Wednesday with famous Dutch economist Barbara Baarsma about whether or not young people will be paying the bill of uh, this economic crisis that we're in. So also tune in on that interview. <laughs> okay. But for now, thank you very much. And uh, Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank Be you, Dr. Borio. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.